All right, so I, um, I don't know if you've been following uh, some what's been going on in Lebanon. Uh, I wanted to give a quick moment to shout out uh, some solidarity with the folks over in Lebanon. Um, but you know, while I'm doing, I wanted to educate you kind of about what's going on there. Um, and by the way, the reason I'm bringing this up, not only because it's tragedy for the working classes over there, but because it's not difficult to see how something, something like this could easily happen in other countries. And I'm not going to use this story as like a scaremong scaremongering, oh my God, it could happen here, it could happen in America. That's not really what I'm here to do. But in my showing solidarity with the Lebanese people, I want to talk about a little bit of what's happening there um, and, and help you understand that the types of issues that we experience here at home and that they're experiencing over there are not so different, right? These problems are similarly related. Um, and if we're not careful, we can end up with the same types of problems uh, that other people have in other countries. So that begs the question, what's going on in Lebanon right now? So a number of things. One, Lebanon has been in a state of political turmoil for a while now, but specifically, you guys might remember a while ago, um, there was that huge explosion at a Lebanese port. Um, and that led to all sorts of backlash uh, in the country, lots of civil unrest. Um, there were accusations about corruption of the government and issues with how the government was running things. Um, all sorts of incompetence and corruption accusations. The prime minister stepped down. Uh, it was a giant mess. Things have not gotten better in Lebanon, um, and the unrest has been has been going on pretty much since then, but for a variety of different reasons. Right now, the issue in Lebanon is that they're having essentially um, a goods crisis. Although there is no active blockade on Lebanon um, by any country, they have significant problems you know, filling supermarket shelves, filling pharmacy shelves, and getting um, gas to their people. So people are queuing for hours at a time to get a little bit of petrol for their cars. And I believe the restriction that they're under right now, as Al Jazeera reported, is they can only fill their cars halfway. So if you imagine, uh, and by the way, it's, Lebanon's another country where lots of people drive. You know, in America, we're also a country where lots of people drive. If you imagine, you have to wait at a gas station for, for by the way, a long way. These lines are huge. I mean, the images of these lines are, are really breathtakingly bad. So you're waiting online potentially for two to three hours in your car. Um, and it's hot, right? So you want to keep the air running. You're washing your gas lower, right, as you're on this line. You go, and you're only allowed to fill halfway. It's crazy, and it's not, by the way, because the Lebanese people are poor. They're not. There's a large, uh, there's a large middle class in Lebanon. They have, uh, they have money. It's not like it's a nation that's totally impoverished. But there's nothing for them to spend their money on. There's no goods, right? They don't have anything to buy. And um, it was interesting because a motorcyclist interrupted uh, the Al Jazeera broadcast where I I saw some of this and said, look, it's not like we don't have money. We do have money. There's just nothing for us to buy. And that's something that could happen pretty much in any country, given any type of scarcity. If you think about what happened um, with the Colonial Pipeline, when the Colonial Pipeline was hacked and you had um, some lower mid middle Atlantic states, uh, Maryland, Virginia, um, and the Carolinas experiencing gas shortages. It's not like the people of Virginia, Maryland, and North in South Carolina suddenly ran out of money, right, to buy gas, but there just wasn't any gas for them to buy. So, you know, prices went up, rationing was, rationing was put in place in some places. I mean, it's not difficult to see that these systems are incredibly fragile. Even the smallest hiccup can cause huge amounts of devastation. And by the way, we're seeing this in the extreme in Lebanon. Another issue that they have experienced which it has happened in other countries, is that their currency has depreciated an incredible amount. So the Lebanese use the pound. It's called the Lebanese pound. It's left over from uh, English colonial rule. And it has depreciated 70%. So it only has about 30% of its total value left. And 
So not only is Lebanon running out of goods, but they're also running out of buying power to purchase more goods, to import more goods, because, because of the way currencies work and the, the way that some currencies are strengthened and some currencies are not, you know, you essentially run out of trust. So Lebanon, like most countries nowadays, use what's called a fiat currency. And fiat currency essentially just means that the currency is as strong as, as the, reliant, the reliability of the government that prints it. So I'll say that again. The currency is only as strong as the reliability as the government that prints it. So in this case, when you look at, when you imagine a country, pick any country, um, you know, let's go with Turkey, the lira, right? So if you think about Turkey and you think about their, uh, their government, although there have been some political instability issues in Turkey in the last decade, the government there is fairly stable. And so the reliance on, if you're relying on the government to pay back its debts in that currency, you can be pretty, you, know, you can rely on that pretty well. That allows the currency to, uh, to have relative strength now, it's not going to be as strong as some others um, for a variety of different reasons that I'm not going to get into right now. But you have a sense that, you know, Turkey will pay its debts. The Turkish, the money that they're printing is worth something because the government is reliable, right? Lebanon has not been so fortunate. The Lebanese government has been in turmoil for many, many years, whether it's because they are being, um, they're constantly uh, at an internal struggle with Hezbollah, which is an Iran-funded political party and militia group. Um, whether it's because they are, have more or less constantly been at a uh, border skirmish slash war with Israel uh, at their southern border, plus a number of other reasons such as internal corruption. Uh, I think two years ago their prime minister was just straight up kidnapped by the Saudis. There's been a lot of problems there. But due to their problems, not only has it created local instability, but the reliability of the government has decreased. And therefore, and by that nature, the reliability of the, of the currency has decreased. And thus, the value of it relative to other countries has gone down. This is really problematic for, uh, this is really problematic for the Lebanese government and the Lebanese people because the Lebanese government now is trying to solve the problems of not having goods by importing more goods. But because their currency is seen as unreliable and the government is seen as unreliable, those goods now cost a lot more because the conversion rates are much higher. Now, this could happen in any country for any reason. If there's a little bit of instability, not that big a deal. The currency, the sovereign currency, probably doesn't suffer. But if you have a long amount of turmoil, like you have in, say, Lebanon or Haiti or some other countries, if they're using a fiat currency there and it's not backed by the value of some other good, then you have this issue where you constantly have your currency devaluing and the money that you have doesn't buy anything um, or prices become so high you can't afford anything, right? So this is another issue that Lebanon is having. And by the way, this could happen to any other nation. Now, there are some nations it probably won't happen to, but it could happen. What I'm trying to get you to understand here in expressing in telling you what's going on in Lebanon and expressing my solidarity with the people there is that, again, these systems are fragile, right? There's lots of interdependence going on and Lebanon has gotten the short end of the stick for a lot of this stuff. So I mentioned gasoline. Also, there's an issue with pharmaceuticals. People aren't able to get medicine. Now, this is uh, not a niche problem anymore, right? We've seen through the COVID pandemic uh, and in huge nations too, India, Pakistan, um, and some other nations that getting oxygen, getting ventilators has been an issue, right? So whether it's actual physical medicine itself or medical devices, we are experiencing some level of medicinal shortage, pharmaceutical shortage. And this is really dangerous. One, because it allows people to die, but two, because it further foments unrest, right? So we're just talking about all the issues um, that are going on in Lebanon, plus issues with food, right? So food and the importation of food is becoming very expensive as well. And there are reports in Lebanon that grocery store shelves are getting close to empty. And again, imagine that you just waited two hours in line to get your petrol. You've 
gone to the pharmacy to get medicine. You can't find the medicine you need. And then when you go to buy groceries, there's almost nothing there. What do you do? Obviously, you have to eat, right? You have to get this medicine for whatever it is that you're supporting, and you need gas to get places until we can find a better way. And so this leads people, and by the way, while all this is happening, the money that you have in your wallet, pretty much worthless, right? So all of this leads to incredible anger and frustration. And this frustration is often taken out at, at the government who is perceived as, and is often a cause of many of these issues. But unfortunately, this is a little cyclical because what happens then is the government becomes even more unstable or it becomes even more repressive. And either way, the currency, can, the currency and the reliability of the government continue to decrease. So you can see that this can spiral out of control. And by the way, these are just regular working people like you and me. We have a sense that the systems around us are going to continue to work and that we can, you know, we can go to the grocery store once a week or we can take our car to the gas station or we can go to the pharmacy and we can get the goods we need. But it's not difficult to see how quickly all this can fall apart when the access to these things is being managed by other people and in Lebanon's case, other countries. So it's really important for us to recognize these systems and to support our, our brothers, siblings, our brothers, sisters, and non-binary siblings in other countries when they're struggling, because these types of issues could happen here. They could happen in your home country. So um, just to close this out, solidarity with people of Lebanon. Uh, my prayers go out to you. This is an incredibly rough time uh, in your history, but also to the people of the world, if you can find a way to support the Lebanese people um, and make sure that, you know, you have an understanding of how the systems of distribution work in your country. You know, make sure that if you, to the extent that you can, you're trying not to be reliant on other nations, because if something goes wrong, if there's some issue, if, you know, if the system hiccups, what could happen to you? And the thing is, oftentimes we don't know, but I'm afraid that we're watching this play out in Lebanon and we are doing so with, uh, without an understanding of how fragile the systems that we rely on